A quick message from the guy who runs this channel. I'm excited to share that our channel now partners with the author of Adopted by Humans to Share Ad Revenue. This collaboration ensures that the creative minds behind the stories we love are supported financially. Thank you for helping us give back to the author by watching and engaging with our content. Now, let's get back to the story. I never learned what Percival did after we walked out that door. I never knew whether or not it was ethical by human standards or not, largely because I didn't know exactly what he'd done. I also had no idea why he'd really done whatever it was. But he was wrong about one thing. We didn't have to wait until dinner at home. The car that took us back had a security driver already waiting, but the result was obvious before we got back to the walker home. I can only assume that the driver being there was ordered by Percival when we were out of sight, and rather than take us straight home, Fove's father requested that the driver take us around the city. There was no real destination, just an endless ride to nowhere with all of us in the car. It wasn't surprising. Humans have a process called fear shedding. After periods of high stress, emotional overload, and adrenal release, when the danger or other cause is gone, they will cry. They will shake, tremble, and even cry. Some of them may vomit, others may sob like human babies. This practice is recorded on texts even about some of their most famous and valiant warrior societies. Contrary to some perceptions, this appearance of fear in the aftermath is not the fear itself, but the body's recovery from courage. I was still not an expert on human children, though over the subsequent years of studying them, I can only say that their capacity for bravery and resilience is something many a species should envy greatly. Fove's passage through that emotional release was lengthy, and I cannot tell you how tightly she was embraced by those who treasured her. The power of a human community in the face of adversity is tremendous, even at its lowest, smallest levels. This went on until William's phone dinged in his pocket. Michael? Rebecca asked, clearly wondering about their infant. William unlocked his phone, checked his messages, the buttons making their usual tapping sound as he traded messages back and forth, until he let one finger tap on what must have been a link. The lot of us leaned toward the device which he set in his lap and let it play. I never forgot what it said, largely because I never forgot their expressions when they heard what the news clip proclaimed. Fourteen men were arrested today on charges relating to national security, transmitting threats across state lines, violent threats toward a minor under the age of 16, and other related charges not released to our office at this time. According to our exclusive sources, a tip was provided that this ring of men intended to destroy evidence of felonious wrongdoing, and so an emergency warrant was granted by a judge to raid and seize the materials. They appear to be tied to various extremist groups, and an unnamed multimillionaire living in the North American state of Kentucky. Now on to a replay of the interview with the child at the center of the recent case involving Xeno interference. William killed the feed and swapped to the phone function, Tuna, how's Michael? He asked. I could see the stress running from his face like sweat, relief making his body melt into the seat. Good, man. Good. You liked seeing that, I take it? I could hear Latunde's cheerful voice on the other side and the faint giggling of the infant behind him. Yeah, yeah, I did, William replied, but he stopped as Tuna rushed out. Then wait till you see the interview. It's on every station. Gotta say, man. She nailed it. Probably it won't stop those conspiracy types, but the way you two talked about your work was so dull I doubt anybody but the most paranoid will be able to focus on it long enough to draw any crazy conclusions. Tuna's bark of laughter would have been audible through the phone even without my ears being what they were. Boring. Gee, thanks. Next time I want to talk about geomechanical integration in stellar construction of generational vessels, I'll spare you the trouble. William said it in an exaggerated voice, and let out a decisive huff at the end. So that makes two good things happening today. See you back at the house, man. Michael is fine. I put on Chibinos, and he's happy as can be. So take your time. Latunde hung up before either William or Rebecca could offer anything in the way of a retort. His cheery voice made the car ride more relaxed, so relaxed that I did what I longed for in spite of myself, opened the window, and stuck my head out so that I was facing the oncoming wind. I had no idea why I had the urge to bite it, but you go with what you know sometimes, and I felt the mood behind me lighten up considerably. That was fast, way too fast, Rebecca noted, drumming her fingers on her knee. I popped my head back in the car long enough to say, 
I went to my embassy. That's probably part of it. My people are very efficient about things. They probably had a hand in getting Percival involved. But that can't be all of it. Fove piped up, wiping her nose and face clean. She swallowed a lump in her throat and suggested, Mr. Barnum sounded funny with what he said last. It sounds like he knew something. Maybe he did something. He probably knew a bunch of people in government, law enforcement, prosecutors and stuff like that, you know? Maybe he called in favors or something. I put my head out the window and faced the wall of wind again. Aside from being enjoyable, it helped me think. Looking back, I was fairly sure she hit the nail on the head. It made sense. Human political tendencies went all the way down to the individual person. They are always building up and cashing in debts, not of the monetary sort, but of the help me when I need it sort. Trades and goodwill are worth more than any amount of energy credits, and it fit very well with what I'd seen in their media already. But why had the old human done this? Why reach out to who could even guess how many human contacts to rush everything from airing an interview to timing the arrest of a dozen or so online bullies? I wanted an answer. I always meant to ask Mr. Barnum his reasons. I'm sure many who read this short account of this eccentric old human would want to know for themselves, but the reason I never knew the answer was because while I meant to ask Percival when the Fuhrer died down and the trial was over, it turned out I wasted my chance. He passed away just a few days after we left his studio, dying quietly in his sleep. He died in his home at a very, very old age by human standards. Ours really was his last task. And if you're curious about Teresa, she did fine. She and her siblings expanded his organization considerably. And by now, you've probably seen at least some of the old films they have repopularized for interstellar media distribution where, it turns out, copyright laws didn't apply. Sneaky, a trifle unethical, but the popularization of that media brought more favorable interest in humanity than a thousand diplomatic envoys. I can't help but think that that was the goal all along. So much as I regretted losing the chance to speak with the old eccentric again, the full weight of that lost opportunity wouldn't be felt for quite some time. How could it be? We had enough to worry about when the rest of the news broke. We were around the dinner table. Fove was looking down at her data pad, a smile on her face of the sort that I didn't know she could make. Not that she couldn't smile, far from it. Rather because I was now accustomed to the faces of humans, I recognized it as something other than the usual happiness. It was, for lack of a better word, evil. The messages streaming through on her data pad, which she now watched openly, were full of pleas and apologies. She answered none of them. She munched on an apple, holding it with one hand, the crisp, sharp noise of her teeth tearing away at the flesh of the fruit, and held the data pad in the other, watching the messages flow over the screen. She was enjoying their distress. She was enjoying their suffering. I have made much of the goodness of humans, that they are kind, loving, affectionate, accepting, and so much more. But they are predators. I was one of theirs now, so I was fine. But these faceless figures who sent threats, harassment, and cruelty her way? In the minds of the walkers, these were the enemy. While Fove watched the screen and munched contentedly, William and Rebecca were on the phone, each one speaking to a different lawyer. The full text of their conversations are not relevant, but I will provide some snippets that highlight the character of parental units that are crossed. So now that you've got the evidence and the first arrests have been made, how long before you go after Wolfbeard's father directly? He facilitated his son's actions. There's no way his son has anything of his own. The pervert just works the ticket booth. It's all his father keeping his failed human, that's what Bailey calls him, out of jail. William's eyes were on fire. The drab, weary look on them was gone, and the man was restored. For better or worse, there is, to humans, something restorative about vindication. Perhaps seeing how his daughter could stand on her own two feet reinvigorated him. Perhaps the fact that she had to at all drove him over the edge. But while I listened to Fove crunch down on the apple, while Michael slapped at the bits of ravioli on his plate, smearing red sauce all over the place in his happy ignorance, I also turned half my ears toward Rebecca. I'm sure it was hard to get a discovery motion granted. Yes, our Bailey pulled some strings, but that's all. Well, that's the problem with non-disclosure agreements. Their contents don't get disclosed very often. But now that you've got the records... Yes, our friend again. Either his people's or... Who knows, maybe Mr. Barnum, I don't know. But what did you find? Rebecca was speaking a mile a minute into the phone. It's worth noting that her voice was chipper, like she'd gotten a wonderful present she hadn't expected just dropped into her lap. 
I sipped my coffee and chowed down on my steak, tearing at the flesh. And let me tell you, human cuisine is a delight. Their best chefs are rumored to be somewhat insane, mad geniuses, artists whose art doesn't endure but is never forgotten by those who experience it. Having tasted the cooking of perfectly ordinary humans, I was prepared to believe it. Fove's own steak lay waiting for her on her plate, untouched. She was savoring her own cold revenge far too much to even care much about the meat in front of her. That many? You can't be serious? 37 non-disclosure agreements? At any other job, he'd have been fired right away. Good lord, so between the bathroom creeping and the underage, how much actual criminal behavior have you found? Things that could get him sentenced to prison or confinement? Rebecca's foot was tapping rhythmically on the floor, her good humor gone and her patience with it. She clenched and unclenched her left hand like she wanted to use it to hit somebody. In most species, the male or female are the only dangerous ones, with the other existing solely for the sake of reproducing with the dangerous one. But on the death world that is Earth, while this pattern of dimorphism can exist, it is not universal. In my own species, a male and female de la Misa are almost indistinguishable from one another, with the female being only a little bit smaller and a little bit more social. Otherwise, we are not much different. Humans, however, have very clear dimorphism between their sexes, but rather than this creating one dangerous sex and one merely compliant one to reproduce, this social apex predator has both deathworlder sexes, both capable of and prone to retribution and violence when it is crossed the wrong way. Fove's serene, contented smile as she watched messages scroll past that, from a quick glance, were people begging her to drop charges against them as they were only harmless pranks. William's burning anger was his relief from the stress under which the family had been placed of late, and as he talked on and on about asset discovery and legal suits that would no doubt ruin a multitude of lives and drag many a name through the mud, his wife occasionally mouthed information to him while she dealt with another aspect of their counterattack, directly targeting the two they now deemed responsible. So, how many have you been able to reach? Well, it is late in the day, so it's no wonder. A lot of them probably moved, it'll be hard to find them. But since we have, she flashed a smile in my direction, an ally in two governments now, just arrange for a very public arrest. We're paying through the nose here, and trust me, it won't be hard. They've kept him out of the public eye so far. The xenophobes have made him an anonymous martyr. Let's drag this gross pig out into the light of day and see how much they love their hero when they can practically smell the dirty socks and old cheese odor through the screen. And I'll bet you won't have to work hard to track down the people they paid off then. They'll probably give up anything to get that stink put away. Rebecca actually laughed when she finished saying that, I must add, humans place a great deal of importance on hygiene. They may not have much of a sense of smell, but their sense of smell is closely tied to their sense of taste. And if that sense of smell is offended, you're offending two senses for the price of one. In my research of what they refer to as the adult industry, wherein males usually would hire a female, again usually, the workers cared very little about how their client looked, but they cared deeply about how their client smelled. Ritual cleanliness is vital to human well-being, and those who reject that are going to fail as humans. I understood Rebecca's remark to be utterly scathing commentary. In my own view, she wasn't wrong. I can still taste him in the back of my throat. I chimed in and drew three very sympathetic looks in my direction. I melodramatically stuck out my tongue and wiped it with a napkin, drawing amused little smiles while the trio savored their moment individually. Rebecca and Michael hung up at almost the same moment and sat down at the table. So, that was interesting. Rebecca said. I held out my coffee cup and she refilled it while she spoke. It seems there were quite a few settlements paid out under non-disclosure agreements, all to young women or girls or their families. They didn't get the records unsealed until today. It was hard getting a judge to sign off on it. But now the facts are out. My cup was warming up like my heart's, and to my surprise, my own predatory instincts were ignited. Glamisa predators are not typically vicious. When we hunt, as some still do, there is no enjoyment in the actual process of the kill. This, however, was something else. It was like circling the prey. When I was a young Glamisa, I tasted this sensation. A colleague of mine took me hunting, and the prey we sought was one of the few prey animals capable of putting up a serious struggle. This particular creature, a malasi, is a tripedal creature that pulls itself on its tentacles to create great leaps. 
It is highly territorial and lives as a loner until mating. When it secures its mate and reproduces, it launches itself toward threats, balling itself up into an armored ball and rolling toward potential threats to its nest. To hunt it, I acted as bait, approached its territory, and got it to chase me. We dug a pit into the ground and put it just over a drop-off. As it chased me, I jumped down and scooted under the drop-off. The Malashi rolled well over it, could not stop on the downward momentum, and then landed in the hole we dug, whereupon my colleague secured the top so that it couldn't escape. I stood over the pit opposite my colleague and felt the unbridled satisfaction of standing over my target. The Walker household felt just like that, and what's more, I liked it. On this channel, we've amassed an extensive library of sci-fi and HFY content spanning thousands of hours, all available for your listening pleasure right now. Take a moment to explore our catalog and discover your new favorite story. You can find links to each story featured in this mosaic in the description below. Remember, what you see here is just a glimpse of the vast array of content we offer.